like I guess. Oh, that's why I feel like it's really like part of me. As everybody's weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, especially in the fall when there's lots to do. Uh, yeah, lots to do, and the weather's like the best time of the year. Too. Uh -huh. All I know is I didn't get nearly as much done as my, my yard work as I needed to, but yeah, it's hard to keep up with the uh, rate that those plans are falling. All right. Normally, I would just wouldn't bother with it, but we have a halfway decent lawn in our backyard, and if I let the pine needles sit underneath the snow, it just bleaches the heck out of the soil. Yeah. If you were unaware of this, uh, pine needles bleach uh, acidic compounds, tannins, into the soil um, to the point that it prevents um, grass, most small undergrowth from growing, which is why if you look in pine forests, there's like there's nothing on the ground other than like sagebrush and pennyroyal. Um because pine pine needles um bleach everything out around them just by changing the soil pH. <laughs> um sorry sorry I'm using they leach when you they when you soak them in water acidic compounds are extracted out of the pine needles, which they call that leaching into the into the soil. Um, it's really like the opposite of leaching. It's in, when you think of leach like a like an animal. Yeah. Um, but that's you know that's why there's the ground is so bare compared to like a, a deciduous forest. Um, it's a it's a reproductive technique for pine trees in general. Um, because it keeps other trees from competing with them. Nothing else can grow in soil that's as acidic as, as uh, a pine forest. Um, but that means that means I have to break in my backyard to get all those pine needles up before the snow starts, or my lawn's gonna be rough next year. Which eventually, when the kids get big enough, won't be a problem. We'll replace it all with native so native species anyway. But for now, it's nice to have a lawn. In a few houses around town that did a really good job with the native. Um, I love I love the way that looks. I love how low maintenance it is. The problem is just that I need space. My kids are very high energy. Yeah. They, my kids have no chill. Um, and so I need to be able to just throw them outside and go play. They can do that in the dirt, but my son's really into baseball, so it's right. nice for grass. Um, anyway. Um, we're going to, I didn't update the outline. We're going to work more on alkanes today. We're going to go through the, the quiz as well um, and, uh, and answer any questions there. A um, couple random quiz questions. Uh, why, do, why do PFAs, so that's either stands for perfluoro, um, car, perfluorocarbons, um, I actually don't remember what the A is coming, but basically it's, it's compounds that have a whole bunch of fluorines attached to organics. Alkyl? Yeah, alkyl. That makes sense. Um, basically, they're not, they don't occur naturally. And so anything that doesn't occur naturally um, is going to persist very, very long time in the environment because especially if it's a stable compound wherever it happens to be found. Um, so like CFCs are an example of a PFA because it's a CFC sensor um, chlorofluorocarbon. Um, those are really, really stable at sea level, but then when you get them to the up, upper atmosphere, they start breaking down and causing the hole in the ozone there. Um, but for a lot of these larger compounds, they don't evaporate or they're solids. And so they stay at sea level. So they're exceptionally stable chemically. And there's nothing around that's evolved to, to digest them. Basically, the only reason that anything, any stable compounds break down is because um, something has evolved to, to eat them or make use of the energy or as, as a nutrient. Um, so the same exact thing happened, actually. I think it was, I'm trying, I always mix up what the specific um, macromolecule was, but I think it was lignin. Um, when trees first, when plants first evolved, um, they, they weren't able to grow particularly tall because they, they didn't have a lot of structure to them. 
And so you had lots of shrubs, lots of grasses, things like that. And so one, one plant species evolved to have um, a particular compound. I, I do think it was lignin um, that allowed them to grow taller um, that turned into trees. And then it became like a race for what trees could grow high faster because then it could collect all the sunlight. Um, but nothing had evolved on Earth that could break down that lignin, um, which means all the trees, when they die, they just lay there. They didn't rot. It's a weird thing to think about, but that's a lot like what plastics are like today, right? Including PFAs. Because there's just nothing around that breaks them down, so they just sit there. Given enough time, um, likely something would evolve to be able to break down those PFAs because they are energy-rich molecules. Um, and there are some, some types of plastics that um, bacteria had microbes have started to be able to digest. Bacteria are usually the first ones to figure this out because they have so many more reproductive cycles. That's that every reproductive cycle is another um, chance for a, a mutation to occur and that could then lead to um, something beneficial that allows them to break stuff down. I do recall reading something about a Japanese landfill where they discovered certain microbes were starting to be able to break down certain classes of plastics. Um, and mycelium, yeah, usually it goes bacteria, the single cell things first, and then you get the, um, and then you start getting funguses um, um, because it's just, that's the ecological niche that, that funguses already have a lot of advantages in. Um, so that's that's why they persist so long in the environment. And that's also why a lot of things, and not just PFAs in general, but um, I don't know the specific mechanisms of, about why things like Teflon are bad um, health-wise, um, but I do know that just mechanically, tiny little particles like microplastics are in the news everywhere right now, right? Microplastics in general can cause issues because they're small enough that they can get into your lungs or they can get into your digestive system and just physically get in the way. Um, like putting like putting um, sand into ball bearings, right? And so when you get something that's that small, you're just really gonna just chew stuff up or gum things up and things aren't gonna work the way that they're supposed to. Um, and so just microplastics and nanoparticles in general are thought to have similar issues. And that's the other reason why um, I, I know that we talked about um, why smoking things is bad because you're inhaling free radicals, but you're also inhaling tiny particles. And vaping minimizes the free radicals because it's at a lower temperature, but you're still inhaling tiny particles. And inhaling tiny particles does the same thing. And so just physically, it's how do I say physically, I mean mechanically, um, even if it's not something that's going to react in a particularly dangerous way, um, inhaling tiny particles or digesting tiny, tiny particles um, can lead to health issues that way. Um, and then PFAs, I know floral compounds also have some more specific mechanisms that are that we know some things about if you've ever heard, like as soon as your nonstick pan starts to flake off, you gotta throw it away um, because there's something about PFAs in general, but I don't know the exact mechanism. Um, and I'm not sure how well it's understood for that matter, because we've only had a couple decades that we've actually been doing research on, on this. Um, so it's a fun fact that, so Teflon is PFA. It's a, um, it's a polymer of, it's basically a big long alkene chain that's, that's saturated with fluorines. Um, and I believe that that Teflon is the most slippery substance known to man. You don't think of a Teflon pan as being particularly slippery because what we think of as being really slippery typically involve like a liquid on, on a surface. But Teflon, anything on Teflon is really, really slippery. And there's its coefficient of friction is exceptionally low um, to get into the physics term. So you, can, you can probably look it up. What's the coefficient of friction between Teflon and Teflon? Um, but it's it's very very low, approaching what it's what it's like to have um, you know tires on ice, for instance. 
That's why Teflon tape works way better than sex tape. That's why Teflon tape is really, really good. Not only is it is it soft enough that it seals the gaps a little bit better in it, but it also allows you to tighten the bolts so much tighter because you effectively used it as it's a lubricant, it's a solid lubricant um, when you when you put it around uh, pipe fittings like that. Um, and then the question about PKA values. I thought this one was a good opportunity to review a little bit of gen chem because you did this in gen chem. Um, I think you may have even done a lab where you determine the PK or the KA values for an unknown acid, right? Basically, if you have a certain weak acid, whether you know what it is or not, um, if you make a solution with a known molarity and then measure the pH, you can work backward from that to figure out what the KA value is. And so, for instance, if we were looking at uh, acetic acid, I'm just going to use the um, abbreviated form, the shorthand form for acetic acid that's not hydrogen actinamide or anything like that. A AC, one's written like this in an OCHEM setting or in a um, biochem setting, is acetate. So remember your basic Ka equation is a weak acid plus water turns into hydronium and the conjugate base, right? And if we if we know what our starting concentration is, we can and we know what our final concentration of hydronium is, we can fill out an ice table. Right, so for instance, I just worked out the math backwards for acetic acid. If you made a 0.25 molar solution of acetic acid, it would be a minus X. Everybody remembers how ice tables work, right? Maybe. Do you guys use those in, in your gen chem? Okay. They're pretty standard, but I use them for everything. And so not everybody's as comfortable as, as uh, I am with them. Um, here we start with zero, start with zero, plus x and plus x, and from the pH, say, okay, well, if the pH is 2.68, so pH equals 2.68, then that means that 10 to the negative 2.68 is your concentration, is your equilibrium concentration of hydronium, right? And so I think we get something like 0 0.0021. And that means that this one's going to be the same. And here, within sig figs, we wind up with it being unchanged, right? What's our addition and subtraction of sig figs? The least amount of decimal places. Least amount of decimal places, or the most uncertainty. The measurement that has the most uncertainty controls the uncertainty of your result. So we're only going to be able to keep it to the hundredths place. So it's going to still wind up being 0.25. So with that in mind, let's see. I'm just going to switch to the Remember, our Ka expression is products of reactants, right? So that's concentration of hydronium times concentration of acetate over concentration of acetic acid. Zero point zero zero two one. Zero point zero zero two one. And 0.25. So we can get a Ka value just from that. So experimentally, it's if you, if it's something that is a weak acid or a weak base that falls in our normal range of pHs, it's pretty pretty straightforward to figure out. Um, and even if you have sensitive enough, enough enough equipment, you can get pK values even for the really really strong bases or the really 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 Weak acids, right? You just need something that's sensitive enough 
um, instrument that you can get lots of sig figs because these numbers, those numbers are going to be really, really, really small in that case. So you're going to need to be able to find something that has a very, very small change in pH. Um, and if it gets small enough, you might actually need to use a different solvent and work out the equilibrium constant for a different equation, a different reaction. And then you guys remember sort of adding up chemical reactions to make the make pieces that you want fit together to get is figure out what K value is for some different equation. You can do that to get back to K a using water if you said you know if we did liquid ammonia and some other really really strong base you can actually do an equilibrium reaction measure the equilibrium concentrations and then work backward to get ka that way so you do have to get a little bit tricky with the with the math sometimes um, but you have all the tools and you've seen most of this this is just the simplest equation we use acetic acid for everything because it's got a a large enough Ka value that it's measurable difference, but it's also a small enough Ka value that um, all of our normal assumptions about weak acids hold true. And it's quite in there, so it's really, really cheap. So uh, it's a really good and relatively harmless. Um, it's a good example one, which is why I still to this day, despite that they haven't taught equilibrium or weak acids in Geez, probably five years now since Carl got here basically this full time. Uh, I haven't taught 102 or 103, um, but I still know Ka value for acetic acid um, off the top of my head. So then getting Ka is just taking a negative log of that. So two sig figs, Ka value for acetic acid is also the same as the Kb value for the most common weak base, which is, you have to take a guess. The big No, uh, it might be really, yeah. No, that is the one I was thinking of. I was thinking it was ammonia, but you're right. No, it's it's um, bicarbonate ion as a base. The Kb value for it is 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. And the Ka value for acetic acid is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. So the log of Ka is the Pk? Correct. P is just a mathematical operator. It's just a function. It just means take the negative log base 10 of something. All right. I thought that, that was good. And like I said, since I haven't I haven't taught that class in a long time, I, I enjoyed that little trip down memory lane and nice tables and um, doing that lab. So, I, we can even do, there are, that is actually a technique that's used. If you have an unknown, and you don't know what it is. One of the pieces of information that's really easy to determine is, well, if I just dissolve it in water and see what the pH does, not only can I tell if it's, if it's an Arrhenius acid or an Arrhenius base, um, if you can measure well enough to get pKa value from that, you can actually kind of like, well, I know I probably have a carboxylic acid group on it, or I probably have an amine group on it. Um, so it's actually a useful technique in terms of, of uh, qualitative analysis too. All right. We didn't spend enough time on this because nobody got it 100% correct. Actually, I think everybody picked the right one as being more acidic, but nobody got the reasoning right. I think, Nikki, I think you were the closest, though, because you said something about the stability of the conjugate base. Um, and that's absolutely right. If there's nothing about the, the starting molecule that makes you think it's unstable, Then what you do is you look at, at the two conjugate bases to see if one of them is could conceivably be more stable. Um, so in this case, if you look at the conjugate bases, going to have NH with a negative charge here versus over here. 
it doesn't really matter where you put these pi bonds because it's going to wind up being the same molecule just flipped around. All right, so the only difference between these two, somebody even said they have the same number of resonance structures, so they're the same, so they're this relatively the same stability. Um, the difference, though, is that one of them has a resonance structure that puts a negative charge on a nitrogen, and one and the other one you can't put the negative charge on the on the second nitrogen. And that's the key. Is it this molecule with your first resonance structure? You can draw. Looks like that, right? So then you get. This resonance structure versus if we do the same exact thing here, oops. we get a resonance structure that has a negative charge in the same physical position. but now it's on a carbon. So the difference between these two is, and this is when we get to use our electronegativity argument that we always kept trying to go to as our first one when it came to which resonance structure is more stable. But both of them have all their, their valence structures filled, right? Which means the second tier of stability was, puts a negative charge on more electronegative elements. This resonance structure puts a negative charge on a nitrogen. This resonance structure puts a negative charge on a carbon. And if we kept going, we, we kept drawing the other, oops, the other way, um, the other resonance structures here. We'll see that we actually can't put the negative charge on that second nitrogen because it's in that in the position um, where it is it's what's known as the meta position um, it's one carbon away or one position away from the substituent that's attached to the aromatic ring that position you can't resonate a negative charge up there you can put a negative charge here you can put a negative charge here and you can put a negative charge here can't put a negative charge on the nitrogen when it's in that spot. So that's what makes this one more acidic is the fact that it has a resonance structure that puts a negative charge on the nitrogen compared to only putting negative charges on carbons. So that one was kind of tricky. What the point, what I wanted you to be looking for is if there's nothing about the initial structure that makes it seem obvious where there's which one is more stable? Look at which of the conjugate bases is more stable. And that sometimes you have to go one level um, and start looking at resonance structures like we did with the carboxylic acids, right? Nothing about carboxylic acid looks like it's unstable, but being able to make a better resonance structure is when you lose that hydrogen, the conjugate base being more stable is what makes them so acidic. Sort of call it this routine. Yeah, it's like it's one of the things that you, until you've seen it, it's kind of hard to come up with on your own. Um, it is in the textbook when they talk about relative strengths of acids, they do go into it a little bit more depth. And and we talked about it, but I didn't I didn't expand on it. We didn't do a whole lot of practice with it. So um, that's why most of the points on that quiz were not on this question because this, this was kind of a stretch question. But everybody got this one right. Multiple choice questions with resonance structures are pretty easy typically, right? Because um, it's pretty easy to use process of elimination and say, well, I know I can make that one and I know I can make that one or see which one doesn't look right. 
That one's got the high bond of the carbon, but it also has the positive charge in that position. That one can't be right. Right, and as we keep going with this, you guys are gonna develop more and more, call it chemical intuition. You'll kind of be able to look at it. I can't quite put my finger on why, but that one looks wrong. Um, so the more time we spend on, on in this class in general, the more you'll have that sort of I, you know, and, and the idea is to get to the point where you can explain why it's wrong um, or why you think a certain thing will happen. You'll get there. Um, but even, you know, I've, I've been practicing this since I started teaching with the random questions on quizzes. Um, a lot of times people will ask me a question, like, I don't know, but my gut feeling is this. And then I can kind of work backwards and see if I can justify what my gut feeling was because I've spent enough time in chemistry um, to, to develop that. But you're not there yet, but you're, you'll get there. You keep at it anyway. Any other, oh, there was one more quiz question. Um, on, That's what makes it red. <laughs> Primary is blue, secondary is the grayish black, and danger is the red button. <laughs> the people who wrote HTML have a sense of humor. <laughs> um, let's look at the quiz though. And just because I didn't grab the specific structures out. So to do the, there was, only one of these was particularly tricky. And it's the one that had the iso, the isopropyl or the methyl ethyl group. Which makes sense now um, because I think three out of the four of you got that it was a methyl ethyl group and the one who didn't may not have been here on Thursday. <laughs> uh, it was my um, So this one, we, we were able, everybody was pretty able to find the, uh, the longest continuous carbon chain. Is seven in a row, um, but the, by getting seven in a row, that gives us a complicated branch, right? That gives us a, a branch within a branch. And so the way we name that is with the parentheses. So just to keep things color coded, um, we had a Simple branch, that's just gonna be a methyl group, right? We'll worry about the numbering in a minute, just leave it blank for the number for now. For this complicated branch, you start with the carbon that's directly attached to your parent molecule, and you count what your longest continuous carbon chain is. So that'd be an ethyl group attached. And then, the ethyl group has a methyl attached to it. And so that's why we use the parentheses is to say that right methyl, a methyl group attached to the ethyl group. The parentheses is what's telling us the methyl is attached to the ethyl. We're not saying it's a methyl attached to the heptane. And so, and again, you can call it an isopropyl group. To me, once you get the hang of it, the parentheses make a ton of sense and they're universal. There's no memorizing once you get the hang of it. Um, if you wanted to call it an isopropyl group, that would be full credit, but then you have to remember your rules for isopropyl, isobutyl, secbutyl, n-butyl, et cetera, terbutyl, all those versions versus if you know how to do this, it's the same rules we've been working with. Um, you just have to know 
how to think in layers, so to speak. Once you're in the if you're in the parentheses, whatever you're adding in the parentheses applies to the last thing in the parentheses. And then outside of the parentheses, we're taking the entire parentheses group and applying it to the parent molecule there. All right, and then just for the sake of numbering to finish this up. Um, yeah, I think we want to count from this side. So one, two, methyl, and three, four, four methyl ethyl, two methyl heptane. But in general, you guys got are getting the hang of the, the nomenclature pretty easily so far. Um, so I'm not super worried about it, and we'll just keep getting more and more practice as we add more functional groups and add more wrinkles to it. I'll, I will also say that I made a big deal about if you see, if you have two of something, and if you say die, there better be two numbers. It's the only time I've ever seen anybody put two numbers without remembering the die prefix. I got, I got two, three methyl, not two, three diamond, whatever the numbers were. Um, on analysis. So that, that's or is this one, right? That was new. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 new mistakes, right? I've never seen that one before. So that gets me interested. I just wasn't <laughs> I was more concerned about the last question. And you won't make that mistake again. Yeah, exactly. Right? All things considered, that's a pretty easy way to learn that lesson. I'll take that mistake on quiz, not on the exam. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> All right. So this was just more practice with the, or the, writing out complicated branches again. Um, so, and then this has the, the various common names. Um, so ISO, same root as isosceles, right? So ISO means the same in two directions. So an isopropyl group kind of makes sense because it's three carbons and you, there's two routes you can take that are both the same length from the um, from the parent molecule. And the isobutyl group works the same way. There's two groups you can take um, that get to the same overall length in the whole thing. This is the other reason I don't really like it. It's because they're saying that regardless of the branch, the entire branch, um, I say regardless of the branch within a branch, the entire thing is four carbon. So it's an isobutyl group. It's just not the same logic as we do for finding our parent compound first place. Um, and, be, go ahead. Would that be a methyl people there? That would be a methyl propyl. Because your longest continuous carbon chain would be three. And so this would be a, methyl propyl in parentheses group. And specifically, it's a two methyl propyl group because this is on the branch on our pro propyl group that we added. This is carbon one and this is carbon two. You could have a one methyl propyl group as well, right? That would look like, pay no attention to the numbering now because I'm just assuming this goes on longer. This would be a one methyl propyl group. It's still a propyl group attached with that methyl group attached to the propyl group, but it's on carbon one of the propyl group. This one's on carbon two of the propyl group. All right, and this gets to the heart of why I want to get away from these common, these common, um, Break are these common names. And so the point here is not to make things more confusing, but just to illustrate, I want you to have seen these titles before so you're familiar with them. Um, and also it makes the point very, very obvious. Um, if you see N on a branch, that means it's a straight chain. So N propyl, this is an N propyl group. It's three carbons and Carbon one is attached here. There's no branch within a branch. So we would just call that a propyl group using our normal nomenclature. Um, 
This one is a sec butyl, not an isobutyl. And so that's the one that was the one methyl propyl. They call that a sec butyl because your branch is attached to a secondary carbon on your, your original or on the, the overall um, branch molecule. But the, the problem, the other reason I really don't like that is because once it's attached to our main carbon group, that's no longer a secondary carbon. Now it's a tertiary carbon. It has three things attached to it. So it's like from the point of view of just looking at the branch, if you ignore this, then yes, that's a secondary carbon. But it just gets more confusing than it needs to be. Um, and because then you can have a tert butyl group, a tertiary butyl group, but that actually is a quaternary carbon because it's actually a carbon that's attached to four other carbons. And so tert butyl is probably one of the most common of these. Um, sec butyl, isobutyl don't get used nearly as often. And they, they also apply them to larger molecules. You'll see um, tert butyl alcohol or isopropyl alcohol. Isopropyl alcohol is three carbons with an OH in this position where if you think about it, like what's attached to the oxygen, this looks like an isopropyl group, right? We're going to learn the better way to name that when we get to naming alcohols. Anyway, um, but this is why you do still see some of these terms around because in pharmacies and, and lots of places they use isopropyl alcohol and they use it with the full name. Um, it turns out like pharmacies and hardware stores are the reason that we have to still know some of these names because they use the old school naming systems. Methyl ethyl ketone, use that on engines, whereas the paint thinner. Um, not in California, yeah, anyway, because yeah. it's illegal in California. Um, but if you go across the state line, you can still get the good stuff. Um, but we don't name it as methyl ethyl ketone anymore. We have a different name for it, a different naming system. Um, but what like kerosene? Yeah, it's pretty similar. Um, what well, kerosene is a little bit of it, it's kind of like gasoline, and then it's a mixture of a bunch of stuff that all distills close to the same temperature. Um, so it's less one compound, but there are a lot of paint thinners are one compound or a closely related compounds, but they use the old naming systems a lot of times. So uh, I still have to cover this. And again, pharmacies and even doctors um, to a large extent have not fully switched. Medicine hasn't fully switched over to um, the nomenclature that the chemists prefer, um, which is, I'll, you'll hear me use this term, but just so you've seen it, IUPAC stands for International Union of Practical and Applied Chemists. Practical and Applied Chemists? I think so. Um, basically, they're the international governing body that determines what's the right way to name things. They're the group that names new elements when new elements are discovered. Um, and so they're the ones that we are pushing on the new school naming system, but medicine hasn't caught up because it's a traditionally it's kind of a slow moving field when it comes to adopting new things, which seems odd to think about medicine as being cutting edge, but um, turns out doctors are not scientists and they're a little bit more resistant to change even than scientists are. The business is. And I like to think of doctors as uh, doctors are just engineers for a very, very specific and particularly poorly designed piece of equipment. Um, <laughs> They're, they're problem solvers. They're good at taking some information and figuring out troubleshooting things, right? Just like a mechanic. Um, they just specialize in the body instead of ports. Um, frankly, ports would be less complicated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's just do some practice. Nothing against engineers. I was trained as an engineer, but it also means I know the difference between a scientist and an engineer.
but sometimes if you're lucky, simply by counting your carbons differently, you can get to the same parent molecule and not have to use a branch within a branch without having to use the parentheses. You can make your molecule simpler just by counting differently. You're not really changing the molecule, you're just changing the, the way that you would name it. Um, so for instance, if there was another way to count that made it so that, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if this was octane, it didn't have this last carbon here, you circle it that way and make it octane, octane with a complicated branch, right? Or if you went this way, it's also octane. And now we have two simple branches instead of one complicated branch. And so sometimes you can get around the parentheses just by paying attention to your counting. Um, these examples, I picked them very specifically so that you can't do that. That game is 10. That game is 10 now. All right, so uh, octave. We'll do the one on the on the left first. So attached to our octane, we have an ethyl group that has a methyl group on, um, within the ethyl group. So this is our really common one, right? So that's a methyl ethyl group. It all actually makes it look more complicated now that I've divided it all up. Once you see it, you know it's an isopropyl group or a methyl ethyl group. Um, it's pretty straightforward for these most common cases. But in the interest of color coding, So it's methyl ethyl octane, and then we just make sure we count from the side that keeps that number lowest one, two, three, four. So four outside the parentheses, four methyl ethyl octane. So with the numbering, that's probably the single trickiest part of the parentheses is if you have to use the numbering, I guess we'll see it on this next one is keeping the right number outside the parentheses versus inside the parentheses. But it always follows our. Think in layers. When you're inside the parentheses, you're ignoring everything else. And once you write what's inside the parentheses, you treat it like it's any other branch. So over here, we've got our propyl group attached. And our propyl group has a methyl group. So within parentheses, A propyl group, a propyl group has a methyl attached, and it's on the first carbon of the propyl group. So the, the complicated branch is a one methyl propyl group. And it's in position five. Of the propyl group of it's on number one, is there only one way to count like the carbons on the purple group? Is they're counting like away from the main chain? Yes. Yeah. So you always put the carbon that's attached to your parent molecule is always carbon one on a branch. Um, when it comes to, we don't get to change how we're counting to keep the number low when it comes to those. So the longer parent chain is Let's say another ethyl group going off the methyl, would that be like an ethyl, methyl ethyl? Do you see what I'm trying to say? Show me. Here, come up here and draw it up here. Something like. Uh, yeah, so I see what you're saying. Yeah. So our 
complicated branch here, we could is the most obvious way to count it would be like that, right? And then you've got you can in theory do parentheses within parentheses. Let's say this parent chain is long enough. Long enough that the counting won't change it there. Um, so what you would wind up, but what you still do want to watch out for is is there another way to count within the branch? Because mm. that's three in a row. That's also three in a row, right? And then it's an ethyl and a methyl. So it's oh, not a branch with right off. So if we counted it that way. That's still a propyl group. So the parentheses would be propyl, and I didn't leave myself enough in the room with the parentheses here. So one ethyl, two methyl propyl. Exactly. One ethyl, two methyl propyl. Curveball. <laughs> but yeah, it's same same thing though, right? If if this was longer to the point where we aren't able to. One, two, three, so that we have to count this way now. Mm -hmm. Then, yeah, you could have an ethyl group that has a, but yeah, just do parentheses within parentheses. Um, what would you ever You can, it's like brackets and then parentheses inside. Brackets get tricky because brackets get used differently in, in coding and the way that they databases call specific molecules. And so brackets have their own specific use for these. If you look at, View um, and look at like the information card for a, a complicated alkane like this. There'll be there'll be brackets used in there for how it's specifying how everything's connected to itself. Um, so it wouldn't be necessarily wrong to do it by hand, but you just want to be careful. Um, and as long as you can count parentheses, parentheses is the safer way to do it. Um, to just keep it parentheses within parentheses. So it would be something like um, that's now a one, two, three, four. So that's a butyl group. And on carbon one, there is an ethyl group. And on that ethyl group, there's a methyl. So a methyl ethyl group on carbon one of the butyl group. So one methyl ethyl butyl, all in parentheses. This is also part of the reason why you start, why common names are still not been fully extinguished um, or replaced, is because if we're trying to say this verbally, we're not going to actually be able to communicate if we need to, right? Unless you already know. Like, like I said, if we're a research group and we're using this molecule all the time, then if I said it out loud, you'd know what I meant because you're used, already used to think of that molecule. But that, in that case, we probably already have a pet name for it anyway, um, based on, it's, it's funny, chemists and physicists get weird about how they assign names to things sometimes. There's certain molecules that are just more trouble than other molecules, and so sometimes pet names are, you know, that goddamn bastard is, you know, within a certain research group, people might know exactly what molecule I meant if I said that. Um, so, and yeah, really, is, if you get to something this complicated, there probably already is a common name. If it's a, if it's a well-known molecule, if it's something like um, a biological molecule in particular, because most of the biological molecules were named before we actually had this IUPAC naming system, which is why glucose has its own name and fructose have their own name. And this, they have an IUPAC name, but it's really nasty. You know, hexa, hexahydroxyl, um, cyclic ether. Like it's a really, like you can get there using our rules, but it's glucose so common it's used everywhere why wouldn't we just call it glucose why are, why are we really fighting biochemists on that um, i'll let them have that one all right and once again use the names um if it has you go from name to drawing molecule use that to double check like oh did i forget any rules that show up in the draw the following molecules to make sure that you didn't forget something. Um, 
you know, if there was a dimethyl in there, that would have been your key to go back. Like, oh, I forgot that I, I wrote something that was dimethyl, but I didn't write dimethyl, right? Um, we all have those moments, and then you realize and you have to go back and write something. That was the first time you that mistake. That was the first time we've seen that mistake. Well, break the records. Hey, I like it when people agree to make mistakes or find new ways to do things. Um, so, and again, you start at the back and then start adding your branches. So we don't, you know, these ones are also easy to keep it organized when you're drawing them out, right? Because I'm drawing these configurations to make it look a little bit trickier than it needs to sometimes to force you to think in angles. But when it comes to you, you drawing your own to answer this question, your heptane doesn't need to be, you know, kinked, it's just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The number one place that I mess up and that I've seen people mess up when it comes to drawing molecules, especially in a skeletal structure, is when you first put down your pencil, say one. Don't say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Because I just drew eight carbons. Right? So start when you put your pencil down. That's carbon one. But that's a pretty easy thing to get used to. And two methyl, four methyl ethyl. Piece of cake, right? Same for decade. Mm, just click what's on here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The other way to double check you got the right number of carbons in your parent molecule is. If it's an even number of carbons, you should end facing the other way from where you started, right? Because that's the number of odd and even numbers, right? The nature of odd and even numbers. Um, if it's an odd number, you should end, if you start with this side facing downward, you should end facing downward. Not something you're really going to mess up on too much, but if you look at, you do it, like, I'm not sure if I counted that first carbon and you want to just double check, at least make sure you got, you know, the, it's an even number, an odd number, which is probably good enough. You probably didn't miscount by two. And then say on the fourth carbon, there's a methyl broken again within the parentheses, do the same thing. Go to the end of the parentheses and work backward. So on the fourth carbon, there's a propyl group. One, two, three. And on the second carbon of the propyl group, there's a methyl. I just approach it systematically and then make sure that your answer looks reasonable. And it's really, like I said, I always found these type of questions way easier than the naming molecule questions. Um, so you'll have both on, on the test. All right, let's take a break there. Let's come back at five after. And we'll continue on a little bit. I think we're going to end a little bit early so we can start lab a little bit early. If everybody's okay with that, nobody has anything scheduled noon to one, right? Would everybody be okay if we if we stopped lecture half an hour early and started lab half an hour early today? Okay. All right, we'll plan on that then too. Five after. You weren't um, offended or embarrassed. No. I I realized after I started talking that <laughs> the group before everybody knew who I was talking about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but I also think we're all going to Yeah, you're fine. Okay. Thank you, though. And do, doing these branches now make, make more sense. It makes it a lot more sense. Okay. Yeah, when I was doing it, I was like, no, what it was and it's been a while since you had 103, right? Yeah, you had 103 two years ago. Maybe three years ago, exactly. Yeah. 
So you had, it's been a, a long, and I think only Rob is the only one who's coming right out of 103, at oh, least here. What's, yeah. you may have just come out of 103, but it wasn't here. So yeah. everybody's sort of reviewing it too. So it's not just you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's the first time I've ever seen this. <laughs> oh, I followed the, he said that nobody got it right, the reasoning, but I followed his reasoning to get to my uh, answer. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't have anything about like the uh, conjugate. Base. Yeah. I didn't include anything about that. But I followed his resonance logic. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, this sort of makes sense. <laughs> I don't think this class has been like my back burner. <laughs> <laughs> <Me too. laughs> Uh, I mean, physiology, physics, physics, well, well, not the calculus. No, <laughs> I don't need that one. So I just thought you know. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Did you take the calc one? I'm gonna be doing that this week. <laughs> and Larry Green requires all the students to see a tutor, so oh. you see a lot of stats. So yeah, you get yeah. three stats classes right now. Maybe it's what we call the comment teaching all the Not even count this term now. 
He's doing that. Bruce. Bruce is doing um, trig and algebra. Wynn's doing the calculus. What? Yeah. <laughs> what? Larry was talking about maybe doing um, calculus six. Yeah. 107. He's definitely doing 107. Maybe he's doing six too. Yeah. Let's see. Do you have the sodium? I want to see what it's like. You can find the examples, but they're probably not that accurate. Sodium, not a sodium, and then benzoic acid. Yeah, every time I try to pronounce it, it comes out all weird and wrong. <laughs> Solubility test. Oh, yeah. Is this the first one? Yeah. yeah. After the first melting point. Yeah. Two points, solubility. Yeah. <laughs> There's just like um, different solids. You know, and this one was with the sodium, the other one has the It's kind of broken. Just very qualitative. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not normal, but it's not what I understand that. Um, and which one? Just so yeah, there's like acid, water, like um, I'm like I don't know. It's a second last week, so I'm like my memory is kind of weird. Yeah. Um. We, I didn't even get them. So yeah. <laughs> not soluble, and there's definitely just solid in there, you know. Yeah, it's like, it just so like cloudy or something. I just it's like not, not cloudy, but like kind of like warped over when you know, like it was still like because according to like what it was saying in the in the um, instructions and stuff, it was like if it's cloudy, then it's not totally like dissolved or something yeah, like yeah. that. Did you heat these samples? Mm -hmm. I think it was a polarity thing if we're looking at so the heat that's created in them. Yeah. So it only the sodium solvent so solvent is that the only one that which one did it um solvent? Yes. So everybody had Halloween costumes big time? <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do any from Stranger Things. Yeah, I got the hair for either that or I was considering going David Bowie and slicking the hair back and doing the, the um, makeup with the, the Lightning bolt, um, but my wife wants to do stranger things. So, <laughs> well, we thought about that, but the kids don't reach out. Wait, on. Like, I know. One, and he really wants to like stranger things, but he was scared. So, there, the uh, young, the kids are going as Nightmare Before Christmas. So, um, my my nine year old is going as Jack. And then my seven-year-old was going to go as Wednesday Adams. Um, but then when when my son picked Jack Skelling, he's like, I'm only Sally. So, and then now uh, we're gonna dress up the the crawling one as uh, zero. Uh, so that'll be fun. And we're going we're going off off the beaten path of stranger things. My wife's gonna go as Robin. Um and one of the Wanted to see if we could get the, the scoops of way out of it, but those ones are really expensive. So she's going as the battle ready, going into the upside down one. Oh, nice. And uh, half of my clothes are already metal hit clothes. So okay. it's pretty easy for me to, to work in. And it's metal. It's like it's a six, aren't you? I did probably wish it was All right. Yeah. <laughs> Let's. So, halogens, we also went over those.
pretty straightforward. It's just new, it's different vocabulary, but it's the same principles, right? We just have fluoro, fluoro, bromo, and iodo as our prefixes. Um, don't really go any further. Even, even iodine is pretty uncommon um, in organic molecules. It turns out as you get larger and larger halogens, the weaker bond you have between the carbon and the halogen, just because there's a physical mismatch in the size between the orbitals that are part of the bonding, right? Um, so plus, as if you get beyond iodo, I'm pretty sure that astatine is radioactive. So you start getting into issues with radioactivity once you get past iodine anyway. Um, so these are the ones that we're gonna deal with on a regular basis. Um, and if you're looking for a way to remember how to spell fluoro, just always remember it's not like flour. F-L-O-U-R is flour, like baking flour. So I just always remember it's not like flour. Um, but if you just left out the O entirely, most people are still gonna be able to figure that out. In fact, if you look at a lot of um, medications that have chlorine in them, their, their common name, their generic name, and their trademark name, a lot of times will have fluoro without the U in it. Um, I don't know why they just randomly decide to change um, spelling of things, but if you look at, uh, there are a couple of, of amphetamine derivatives that get used as decongestants. Um, that, like, if you've seen those, like those inhalers that are um, nasal decongestants when you have a, a cold, they're basically the mirror image of methamphetamine, um, but in the form that your body can't metabolize it as a um, as a drug. It's it's still technically a drug. You can't metabolize it the way that um, recreational. Um, methamphetamine is processed. Um, and so, but the, the, if you look at the, the active ingredients on it, it's like, um, it should be a levorotatory methamphetamine, but they, they write it out as lev met amphet. Like, they're not really fooling anybody. It's looking close <laughs> enough. They decide to switch the pH into an F, and they just leave off the H on the math part. Um, but so I don't know why sometimes medications do that. Um, but the one that I'm thinking of for fluoro is 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 it generic um, name of monopin? It's like fluorazepam. Fluorazepam. Yeah, I think it doesn't have the U in it, but it's because it's it's a benzodiazepine that. Um, has a fluorine attached to it that makes it behave a little bit differently. And I think that that's quantum. Um, but either way, it's a, you know, it's an anti-anxiety, anti-psychotic um, drug, but it's just spelled differently for whatever reason. So point being, don't get too hung up on the spelling for these because it seems like you know, medicinal chemists and pharmaceutical chemists change them at will anyway. Um, but all of our same rules. They might all they might also leave off the E at the end, amphetamine instead of amphetamine. Again, they're not cool with anybody. Um, so there's nobody who's ever had a chemistry class. We talked about cyclo groups. I'm gonna skip through parts of this. So the entire lecture is not just um, review. Can you look at the uh, chlorine halogen on the last slide? Uh, yeah, this is chlorine. Yeah. Is, is so here's another example of one that you can technically name, have two correct names or two names that are in unambiguous if you use the parentheses. Um, so if you name it like that, that's propane, right? So that would be a methyl group on propene, and the methyl group has a fluorine attached to it. But there's a better way to do it because that's also propane, right? So, but you could, in theory, name it as fluoromethyl 
propane. Or, or, or two. one fluoro or two methyl propane. Um, and typically, if you can avoid parentheses, it's a good idea to do it, especially if you have, have something other than a, a halide or something other than a carbon. Um, we'll get to the point where some of these functional groups where it doesn't, it's not about finding the longest possible carbon chain, it's kind of about finding the longest possible carbon chain that has that functional group in it. But the halogens are not quite that important. They're like the second lowest of the low. Alkanes like the lowest priority. Um, halogens are the second lowest priority. So you will still see sometimes where it's written, you have a situation like this where your branch has a halogen attached to it. Um, and again, this is also why it's a good idea to have, you know, how to use these parentheses too, because even as we get um, other functional groups, they're always kind of competing for which one is the most important. You always want to put the most important functional group on your parent molecule. That sometimes means there's, there's other things normally we would name um, with a suffix that now need to be named with a prefix or in parentheses instead. Um, so for instance, So for, and again, we'll do all this when we, when we cover these functional groups. But this is the carboxylic acid. That one's one of the most important ones. And then this is an alcohol, it's less important, but it's still something you would normally need in the suffix. So normally we would say, well, it's going to be the longest continuous carbon chain that has the OH. And actually, let me, that's the other thing. So make that. Oops. So your longest continuous carbon chain that starts with the carboxylic acid would be this one. And then you've got a methyl group that has an alcohol on it. So we would say that this is what, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is hexanoic acid, but it's got a methyl group on carbon two and it's got a hydroxy methyl group on carbon three. So we would say in parentheses, we'd say hydroxymethyl. Again, I don't expect you to remember that at this point, but it's pretty easy to see where hydroxy comes from. It's a hydrogen and an oxygen, right? Um, or it's a hydroxide group attached as well, um, attached to this hexanoic acid. So again, using the prefixes in the parentheses means that we can get around having um, having these complicated branches pretty easily once we know all the, all the right terms. All right, any other questions on, on halogens? Then cyclogroups is actually perfect because the last few things here are not all that um, when it comes to properties of alkanes, usually with these chapters, there's going to be a chapter on this is a new functional group. Here's how you name it. Here's what some of its physical properties are, some chemical properties. And then there's in the follow-up chapter is, and here's all the reactions that go along with that functional group. So for alkanes, alkanes don't have much in the way of reactions. Um, they're pretty non-reactive beyond just if you put them with heat and oxygen, they burn. Um, is is the primary reaction that they have. Um, there are a couple others that we'll talk about eventually, but not till the end of free radicals. Um, but so their properties are pretty straightforward as well. Um, would we consider them polar or nonpolar? Nonpolar, right? Carbon and hydrogen bonds are a definition of that's that's our crossover point, right? Anything more electronegative than carbon to hydrogen is a polar bond. So that means alkanes are totally uh, nonpolar, unless there's a halogen attached, in which case you might have some. So a halogenated alkane can be polar. And that's actually what makes the CFCs 
so effective is that it was a small molecule that you can put two fluorines and a fluorine on carbon. Um, and all of a sudden, again, it looks like it was just methane in terms of how reactive it would be, except that um, now you have polar bonds associated with it. So it actually is almost as polar as water, which means its phase transitions and its specific heat are similar to water, which is why it's such a good refrigerant. Um, because it's non-reactive, doesn't cause corrosion or anything like that in metal parts. So you fill a condenser coil with this instead of water, and your condenser coil lasts longer and is just as effective as if you were using water going through phase changes. Um, so if they're non-polar, would we expect any of them to mix with water? No, there's, there's a threshold typically. Um, even if we do add a polar group to it, Typically, you need one polar group for every, say, four carbons. And if it's a really polar group, like a, an alcohol, then it's one alcohol for every five or six carbons in order to be able to mix very well with water. Um, so glucose, lots of carbons and hydrogens, but also lots of OHs, so it dissolves pretty well. Hexane or cyclohexane, on the other hand, doesn't, despite the fact it's similar shape to glucose. So if there's no polarity, what's going to determine higher boiling points or higher, higher melting points? Size. Why? Um, the intermolecular attraction, the uh, strong nuclear force. Not quite strong. You say strong nuclear force? Strong and weak force. Strong and weak force. No, that's all in the nucleus. Um, it's the, it is the intermolecular forces. It's the other ones, the ones that everything had, right? Because there was a, there was ion dipole interactions that were super strong. And then there was hydrogen bonds that were really strong. And then there were polar, that dipole dipole interactions that weren't hydrogen bonds that were pretty strong. And then there was the one that every molecule had. Just by virtue of having electrons, you have van der Waals forces. You remember that term? Van der Waals forces are those temporary dipoles that because the electrons exist as probability, there's a certain probability that all your electrons happen to be gathered on one side of the molecule, even if it's not a polar molecule, just as a temporary thing. And so you wind up with a temporary polar, polar molecule where even if it's a totally non-polar molecule like this, um, or actually even iodine is a really good example too. If you just have an iodine, sorry, not iodine, we use um, a noble gas, let's use xenon. Xenon has a whole lot of electrons around it and it's just a single atom, so it's non-polar, but there's a possibility that at any, any given time you get extra electrons sort of like shifting to one side versus the other. Think of it almost like tides. Like there's on any given point, there's more of the water on one side of the earth than the other. It's temporary. And in that case, it's caused by gravity, but ignore than that for a second. If it was just all totally random, there was there would be a possibility that more water molecules were on one side of the earth than the other at any given point, right? Same is true for the electrons. And so when that happens, you wind up with a partial negative and a partial positive, even though the molecule itself or the atom itself is non-polar. So that's why everything that has electrons has some attractive force between the molecules. And the more, it turns out that the more electrons something has, the more wishy-washy they are, the more that they can temporarily be found on one side versus the other. Um, we refer to that as the molecule being polarizable. More, the larger a molecule is, but the more electrons a molecule has, the more polarizable it is. The nice thing about number of electrons is tied to just how many atoms you have, right? Um, so basically the bigger a molecule gets, the more polarizable it's going to be, even if it's non-polar. So that's why some molecules that are totally non-polar, like say butter, fats in butter, they're totally non-polar for the most part, non-polar enough based on the number of carbons. Um, but they still have a high melting point 
relative to something like propane, because propane is just physically a smaller molecule, has fewer electrons, therefore less van der Waals interactions. Right, so methane or ethane? Ethane's bigger, higher boiling point, higher melting point as well. Butane or propane? Butane. And pretty quickly, butane and propane are both, propane is a liquid at room temperature and atmospheric pressure, but barely. Like it evaporates really quick. And if you, if you had a lighter that wasn't sealed, um, you know, very, very quickly, it would be gone because it evaporates really easily. But as you start getting past that, start, you know, gasoline is basically octane, right? Gasoline, yeah, it'll still evaporate, but you could leave a bucket of it sitting out for an hour and still come back and have some left. And as you get bigger and bigger past that, then you start getting into things like um, you know, paraffin wax or, or um, Vaseline for that matter. Vaseline is also made from, from crude petroleum, um, but it's crude petroleum that where the, the distillate is condensing at a much higher temperature. So it's still just hydrocarbons for the most part, still totally non-polar, um, but it has a much higher boiling point, higher melting point because it's just bigger molecules. Right, and the extreme cases of that is if you take if you take simple hydrocarbons and you make them into polymers, now all of a sudden we're talking about molecules that might have a molecular weight in the um, they might be 300 carbons long. If you have something that big, it's really going to have a very, very high melting point, even though it's still totally nonpolar. Right? So polarity is one of the pieces that goes into what something's boiling point will be. The other piece is how big is it? The 300 carbon chain would have a higher probability of the electrons going inside. Now. Exactly. Yeah. And it turns out that if you have these big long chains, they can kind of sort of like nest together. Um, if you had You can see how the, just these big, long, straight chain carbons, they kind of fit together pretty well. But if, if you start having more branches in them, then they're not going to fit quite as well. So there are some other factors into this that, um, that go into this. Um, are those the minimum forces? Yeah. So basically, yeah, the closer these can get to each other, then and when the green one has a partial negative at the top and a partial positive at the bottom, that causes a dipole temporarily in the one right next to it, right? And so then this one winds up having matching forces, right? And the closer these molecules can get to each other, the stronger those interactions are going to be. Um, so it's a little, so in general, big, long, straight chain alkanes are going to have a higher um, melting point, higher boiling point than something that's a big branched molecule. The big branched molecule is going to have its own different properties by virtue of having all those branches, it has more surface area. And it might react a little bit differently, but it's not going to be, it'll affect things like density and it'll affect things like the melting point. Um, uh, the analogy I, I like to use when it comes to density is it's like putting a bunch of toothpicks into, into a cylinder, into, into a container, right? Um, you can fit a lot of toothpicks really densely, but the second you take, if you take out like, I don't know, 10 of the toothpicks and sort of break them in half, but not all the way so that they're kinked and try to put them all back into the same container, it won't go, right? So things like density are gonna be affected by that. And because they can't fit as tightly together, that'll also slightly affect melting point and boiling point. If they can't be as tight together, then those interactions can't be quite as strong. All right, let's end there for today. And I'll just, I guess one quick, one quick thing. Um, anytime you see that rainbow color, the cool thing about that is, is that um, well, that's usually a result of non-polar molecules sitting on top of water. 
And um, basically, there's since the intermolecular forces between the alkanes are so low, um, it'll actually spread out to, let's say, single molecule thick sitting on top of water. If you have an infinite amount of water, like an ocean, um, that's why oil spills are such a big deal, is because, yeah, it's it's a lot of oil that comes out, but compared to the amount of water, that's a you know almost literally a drop in the bucket. Um, but the fact is that it will spread till it's a single layer thick, a single molecule thick over as much space as there is. Um, which is why they do things like they basically build these little corrals out of things that are floating. They don't need to keep it from going underwater because the oil sits on top. They keep it on top and that keeps it from spreading out. And what causes the rainbow effect is literally the difference in um, the number of molecules that are sitting on top of each other. It's a little bit thicker, it diffracts, it refracts the light a little bit differently. So it's basically it's acting as a lens, and the way it's acting as a lens is based on how many molecules thick that particular part of the layer is. Um, if it's you know a tenth of a micrometer thick versus if it's two tenths of a micrometer thick is going to change whether or not it appears pink or green um, because you're starting to get into that realm where wavelength light is the same as the um, thickness of the layer that it's traveling through, which is kind of cool. So anyway, all right, let's let's take a break. Still get an hour break. Um, so let's come back. Let's go to lab at 1230. Um, and then we'll get started and hopefully we'll get through lab. And, um, my son's baseball practice got moved up from 4.30, which was already tight to 4.15. So, um, you know, hopefully we'll have enough time to get everything you can put together. Still clean up. That's okay. You guys have been doing a good job of tightening up after it. So, but 12.30, I'll see everybody there. Also, it's the same lab as we were going to do last week. So everybody already has the write-up or the um, procedure. So you can come in ready to get going on it. Rob, in particular, you already know. <laughs> yeah, so I, I pushed that one until night. We just pushed the rest of the labs back a week. Full lab out. Did you do that or did you make that space already? We have had one, one week to give, I think. Um, but yeah, if we, if we needed to, then we might put it into the winter quarter. Or there's, there's some labs that just aren't quite as valuable as others. So we kind of just make a Use it as a filler down in between two. That's it. Perfect. Well, see you then. See you soon. Uh, you also have a dangerous. What's that? You also have a dangerous. Um.